Hello everyone, this is Defense Politics Asia and welcome to the DPA panels. And this time around, we're going to go all pro-Ukraine and uh, to go to, to look at the Ukraine war to discuss about it and uh, from an entirely pro-Ukrainian perspective. Because as you guys uh, would know by now, no, the Defense Politics Asia's viewership is largely in the neutral and pro-Russian side. You know, the pro-Ukrainian viewers are very, very little. And I think it's very, very important to understand the views from the pro-Ukrainian side or at least the pro-European side. Because uh, if you do not understand and you just ridicule each other, then we are never going to get peace. So it's very important to know the other side. And uh, we have uh, four guesses. No, they are all from the DPA open mic. And uh, they have always all have been uh, very brave to come onto the open mic to share their views. And, I, and I'm very happy to welcome them into to the DPA open mic to share you know, and discuss without you knowing the disruptions that come with the DPA open mic. So I would like to know uh, the individual panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we can start off with uh, Kyle. Yeah, hi guys. My name is Carl. I'm working in IT. Uh, I live in Luxembourg, spend a lot of time in Spain, and originally I was born in Hungary. So uh, I wanted to say a few words before, if you don't mind, just because why I'm supporting Ukraine in this uh, war that... Uh, uh, so Hungary, you know, is Central Hungary. We are Central Europeans. Sorry, Central Europe, Central Europeans. So we are, we are in a conflict zone uh, between big uh, empires and powers uh, most of the time during the history. So such almost like Ukraine now at the moment between the West and the East. So uh, we experienced this when the German. Uh, war machine went through on Hungary and on the other side when the Soviet army went through uh, on Hungary. We suffered a lot. We had a lot of uh, revolutions, independence wars from 1848, uh, 1944, 1956, and then in Central Europe, 1968 in the Czech Republic and 1980 in Poland. We were fighting a lot against the Russians. And uh, I have a lot of stories from my grandparents, from my parents, like how they experienced during the times when the Russians were in Hungary. You know, they were occupying the country basically for uh, 30 years after 1956. And they lots of, lots of atrocities they were committed during the Second World War. So... Uh, I have no other chance uh, uh, from a moral and ethical perspective than to support anyone who fights for the freedom against this uh, Russian uh, uh, or uh, the ex-Soviet Union empire. So that's all from me. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Chaco. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Chaco. I've been on the open mic two times before, I think. And uh, I'm from Germany, still studying, not working uh, yet, like Carl or others here. And uh, yes, I, I've been adamant of, of supporting Ukraine because for me, it's not necessarily about the experience that I or, or my forefathers have had with, with Russians or haven't had with Russians. Uh, actually, my family, um, no matter which direction I go, mom or dad, was actually not fighting in the war. <laughs> so kind of an odd for, for a German guy. But um no, my, my bigger issue is that Russia, as of now, under this authoritarian leadership, is kind of unsettling a, a, um, a, an agreement that Europe has had for, very, for a very long time, that you simply do not shift national borders uh, because you say so, that you don't just go at and say, you have an, like, a racial minority there that is from my country, and therefore I will accuse you of anything and take the land from you. And... Um, Probably also because the, the perverted way in which it's done is that, that does feel very familiar to me because uh, the way of just accusing the other side of being the Nazi and being the, the right wing fascist has been standard procedure in Soviet and Russian foreign politics for the past for the past time of the Cold War. I mean, the Berlin Wall used to be called the anti-fascist wall. They framed the allies for the bombings of Dresden and said, actually, they were the inhumane ones and we came to liberate you. And now they are. Um, not punishing the former Nazis and reinstating them in their security services, while we are, of course, your saviors, and we, 
will always free you from Nazism and anything else. So it's it's very much part of the of the of the Russian diplomacy and also part of the of the Russian way of doing war propaganda to always ex accuse the other one of being or supporting the Nazis in alluding back to the great periodic war World War II back then. Which is why, why for me it never really, it never really caught on to me. It rather seemed like it was, it was such a poor excuse as well, um, considering how how many countries, of course, have have problems with nationalism and have have neo-Nazi groups, which sometimes have too much influence. And to be honest, of course, you have an, an an influence of nationalist groups in Ukraine that, if you go really deep into it, goes beyond what many other countries have. But using that as an as an excuse to invade a country from three sides, first trying to knock out this government which you then fail at and then saying, oh, yes, you know what? We're just protecting our people here and we actually we actually want peace. But how does that peace look like? Well, we don't know. Um, and then annexing half the territory, it, it all is just like, for me, it, 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 it's it's so uncomprehensible how people who go back and, and look at the history of, of how, how authoritarian Russian foreign policy has been like will see this as as a sort of liberation war or a, a sort of justified intervention. It's It's just... I don't know. I, I have a hard time understanding that point of view. And that is, apart from the fact that Ukraine obviously has the right to defend itself when somebody attacks them, is why I very much think that we and I definitely uh, should support Ukraine. Thank you, Taco. Uh, Morten. Okay. Uh, my name is Morten. I work in the oil and gas industry. Um, why I support Ukraine? Well, like the last panelists said it all. But I feel like it's their independence fight. And when you look at how the Russians have, uh, what they have done, all the atrocities and everything, it's a no-brainer for me to support Ukraine. Thank you. And Martin, where are you from? Norway. Norway. Oh. So, uh, Sebastian. Uh, I'm from Germany. I'm currently writing my bachelor thesis, and I think I'm mostly against Russia for the reason of the invasion cannot be justified. There cannot be any justification for any country to invade its neighbor, with maybe a single exception, and that is if a current genocide is taking place, and looking at the United Nations, which China, India, and Russia are part of, there has not been a genocide of the Ukrainian people in Donbass. And therefore, I think any invasion is absolutely unacceptable. And a uh, war on the pretense of minorities or historic claiming of land is incredibly dangerous, especially in Europe, because I think there isn't a single piece in Europe that hasn't been claimed by every major power in Europe at some point in time. So the invasion of the Russians for Ukraine just cannot be justified and therefore has to be opposed. Thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> so um, one, one thing will, I think people will be interested to know is how you all get the information about the war because everybody has different sources and uh, so the media diet actually definitely you know would affect how we you know understand what is happening. So you know, can you all share about you know the sources that you guys uh, uh actually you know gather the information from? Anyone want to discuss? <laughs> I can okay, start. Let, okay, okay, let's start. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can start. Uh, when the war started, I just started watching the news, and then then uh, I started on YouTube, but I, I watched all the sites. I, I just, I had a lot of spare time. So I watched actually everything I, I could find, everything. Uh, and then I have never been on Twitter before, but then I accessed uh, Twitter. And now my primary, primary source is Twitter. You can find a lot of good intel on Twitter. Yeah. There's a lot of things that uh, cannot be published on YouTube, I think. So, which is why, you know, Twitter, you no, know, you do have a lot, like, especially those brutal, you no know, bloody footages or uh, those, 
well, most of these footages cannot be on YouTube, uh, which is why I think Twitter, that like for me, Twitter definitely give you more more uh, nuances, I think, than YouTube because YouTube ultimately is still based on analysis and uh, people's opinion. Where else? No, where else do you guys? Any well, different uh, ones? Uh, yeah, I, I think I've, I've had an, a similar experience to Morton, just that I, I never used Twitter before, actually. I was uh, never a big fan of Twitter. I thought, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's always... It's, it's the most polarizing media because people only say what they think and then the others react underneath. But um, when, when, when the war started on the 24th of February, I realized, okay, if I want to know anything, because I, I saw how the news really had no idea. They showed maps of Ukraine that didn't work. They showed fit, footage that clearly was just published by, by some guy and they had no idea where it actually was. And then I um, went on Twitter immediately and uh, started looking for accounts uh, actually by, by checking out the different locations that the news was talking about. So uh, first Hostomel and Kharkiv and uh, I don't know what's go what was going on around Kherson and everything. And um, it was pretty interesting because at first I was like, fuck, so Russia is taking over Ukraine again. Now I can see how it's happening. And it was unbelievably sad because I was always somebody who um, thought that Russia really was not satisfied with what it got in the previous deals uh, in, the, in the two Minsk agreements with both sides sporadically shelling each other, Russia not really being in control of much except for the territories. Uh, that have, have previously been taken. And so I kind of expected it to escalate at some point. And when I actually did, I thought, fuck no, it's, it's gonna be over soon. But pretty much in the first like two or three days, I realized, oh my God, it's not gonna happen. Because you could see how the Russians got beaten back at Hostomel, how at, at Kharkiv, the same thing was happening. And once you saw how they tried to go into Brovary and they were entirely annihilated, um, I realized this is actually something that will not turn out the way they thought it would. And uh, yeah, since then, I've, I'm, I'm trying to always get um, two sources to compete with each other. So um, I think if it's Twitter or, or Telegram, doesn't matter which one you use for that. Um, get, getting both Ryber and then on the other side, Deep State is probably not too bad to compare how their two maps look. Then, of course, watching DPA. Always, always doing that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think getting, getting competing information on what's going on the ground is very important. And except for that, um, also trying to, to get uh, always sources that, that compete for the same information from two different point of views. So traditional media, and then again, um, something that is always opposing what uh, the traditional media would say. And I think if you go with that, you're, you're off to a good start. Hmm. Any, any other special sources that you guys find from? Um, well, I kind of have four major, major sources if i want to look at the first person view kind of i'm mostly looking at twitter uh, if i want to see the russian view i'm reading Ryber. and for the big picture there are two things on youtube i can think i can but actually three things i can very much recommend the first one is perun he has very in-deep analysis mm -hmm. of a lot of topics uh, and he names all his sources that is very important for me. Uh, the next one is Militär und Geschichte mit, uh, mit Thorsten Heinrich. I know uh, him, yeah. That's very good. He is very unpartial. He tells you everything mm. and he is very peculiar about his language. Uh, he never says, this is going to happen or this has happened. He always says, as far as I know, or these sources tell you that. and. That way he can show you the whole picture. And for the meta analysis kind of, I mostly rely on Oberst Dr. Markus Reisner from the Österreichisches Bundesheer, the Austrian mm -hmm. Armed Forces. I know oh. that. Yeah. Is the one that wears the uniform? Uh, yeah. he's, the, he's a bold. military guy, right? He's bald, yes. <laughs> I, I, I think I might have seen that. I, I think it was a good one. He does things in English and German, and even the, in the German videos, he's using the English presentations, so he might as well just watch the English one. It's kind of weird. <laughs> cool. cool. If I may, I would recommend a few uh, podcasts from the mainstream. The Telegraph is really good, I think. They have a daily podcast, uh, Ukraine, the latest. They summarize everything, what happened during the day. Uh, in the last 24 hours, this is the Telegraph. Uh, the Economist has uh, the week ahead of Russia, uh, week ahead in Russia, I think. It's a weekly. Um, that's also good. 
Uh, I really like the the Naked Pravda. It's more like an editorial content, and uh, the Institute of Study of War, obviously, and the Rusi.org. Plus, uh, from these private, from these military bloggers, I really like. Uh, uh, there is a an American guy called Jake Bro. I think. He's very good. He's do, he's doing a daily assessment. There is um, a Ukrainian uh, Denis Davidov. I think he's very much uh, uh, up to date. Like really, I think he has a very fresh information about everything. That's why I like that most of the time. And he's also it's quite quite reliable. And. Um, well, a few more from these uh, private bloggers. This is from YouTube, and I follow. I, I'm lucky because I have some journalist friends who are following because of their work. A lot of uh, sources on Twitter, and they have like uh, some channels or some lists, uh, collects, collected, collect collections of uh, to follow. Maybe I will share it uh, after the the pot, uh, sorry the broadcast. I will yeah, put it I can in put the it comment in the or something. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I can put them. I can put all these links if you guys want to share. I think if you should uh, those very very good ones that you think you want to share, I can put it in the description. Oh, so, yeah. cool. so I also have um, another one. It's an American it, War on the Rocks. Mm -hmm. it, it's a podcast. Uh, <laughs> It's a military guy, I think. So a really good analysis. But I also watch uh, this English guy, a tippling philosopher or something. I think it's. I think I find him quite good because he he goes through all the Twitter posts and uh, break them down. He, he's obviously really pro Ukrainian, but I, I feel like he's trying to. Yeah, not cloud himself too much. So I, I think he's trying to be as honest as he can. Yeah. Do anybody follow Russian sources? I'd be very honest. Yes. I, I, I sometimes I, I follow the map sources from Russian pro Russians, and uh, I see what some statesmen, but mostly through some Ukrainian bloggers when they quote or, or citate something from them, but I don't really follow them because I just, um, I don't know. I found it very propagandistic and very far away, the objectivity. But do you guys can recommend Russian ones which are useful and reliable? I, I uh, think, oh, sorry. I, I, I don't find, I try to watch as many as I can, but I find it very hard uh, actually to watch, like mm -hmm. Wagon So and Gherkin and Strokov. Or I listen to the Russian MOD, but I feel that sometimes just funny. So mm. <laughs> I find it really hard. They, uh, right after they promised. What is going on? I would say that when they uh, weren't even in the country yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but I think okay. I think, I think Riber, we can say is 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 yeah something. Riber yeah yeah, yeah Riber is pretty good. The, the closer something gets to reality, of course, um, you could say the more dangerous it is because it's not always easy to spot when they really twist the language. Because um, I mean, mostly Russian sources will also try to avoid saying Ukrainian soldiers. I think by now they're kind of over it. But at the start, you could see how they were always talking about nationalists when they were fighting Ukrainian soldiers. Like it was just so off and so odd. Um, but they keep doing it, of course, to feed the narrative. And I think if you just go at the map, Rybar is not too bad. And especially I was very surprised during the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv. You could spot which Russian bloggers tried to stick to something that had to do something with reality yeah. and which ones were just off. Like some people were pretending like, oh, no, they're holding Balaklia and they're getting reinforcements from somewhere. Well, yeah. Rybar was, you know, exactly. two hours ago, every third blogger said yeah. something like there is no panic yeah. going on. So I think, yeah, yeah Rybar for the mapping, definitely. Yeah, because from my from my uh like analysis like when I was doing all the plot plotting, I can tell you uh Riba is the most reliable on the pro Russian side, and uh there's nothing coming coming close to them. But even for Riba, they do make mistakes because uh sometimes their sources can give them the wrong information. Deep State UA uh is very very reliable. Um, I would say that it's even more reliable than Riba in terms of accuracy. The problem is uh Deep State UA is a bit slow sometimes. 
uh, mm-hmm. maybe due to operational secrecy, they do not want to you know unveil certain information, but uh, they tend to see, quietly map up, uh, change the mapping, and uh, usually they they do not talk much about Ukrainian uh, defeats. So you you can see the 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 map going backwards uh, on the on their mapping, but they don't talk about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So so you know that's deep state UA, but I, the their mapping are uh, usually very very accurate. But Russian Russian uh. No, you have to be very careful because there are also many. Uh, they are really propagandic, and they are mm-hmm. also they are uh, part of misinformation campaign from the Western side. I'm not sure mm-hmm. who is behind them. They are literally posting fake uh, mapping uh, mm-hmm. on a pro-Russian kind of narrative, and it just confuses the entire you no know, pro-Russian uh, ecosystem. Yeah, so a lot of noise, yeah. and also very hard. I think for them. If they want, it would be very difficult to to provide real uh, information because, uh, especially if it's a negative information, then they yeah. could uh, face to the you know like uh, like they like cr- it, it's a crime basically like they spreading like uh, how they call it like the the honesting discrediting the U- the Russian military and they can end up in jail in a few hours. So I think that was so, uh, that, that's, that was actually that's a challenge issue. Mm-hmm. because that was actually a problem a few a few months ago, where you no know, there is this rumors you know of like crackdown on these Telegram channels and then it became quite a big hoo ha. Then uh, after that they they get clarification from the Ministry of Defense or something where like they are not going to be prosecuted and they can continue to do what they want. But I think yeah. it was first cracked by War Gonzo. War Gonzo was really pissed. And then Riba and everyone, all the credible ones are talking about it. Then they, they, they try to investigate who is the one that sent out that letter, but they cannot find it. So, you know, yeah, but on the Ukrainian side, it's the same thing. They have the same law. Uh, you, 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 can, you cannot criticize the Ukrainian side. So, so it's very, end up, you know, I have to cover to, from both sides. And uh, the language, you see, they, they use also, they are very careful. Everyone is very careful. I guess some of the Ukrainians I follow, I think they even employed by the Ukrainian ministry, minister of information or something like that. So that's actually, they probably work uh, independently, but you know, they influenced by the, the, the official informations and I mean, they have a certain control. This uh, guy, I think he's called Starsky, uh, for example, who's actually, uh, it's, he's always in uniform, so it's just his main job is reporting from the war zone. Mm. Uh, there's well, also there's kind of funny people who by now like set themselves as like uh, media officers in a way. I think especially uh-huh. with, with with the battle of of Bakhmut and also before, you always have like similar videos coming out from the same officers who tell you what's going on. You know how 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 everything's going, what they're planning, what they're thinking, and uh, yeah, I've I've seen that. I don't haven't. I mean, my exposure to to um, more pro-Ukrainian countries is obviously higher, but I have seen that less from the Russian side that they have the same. Also, army officers talking to the camera and telling what's going on with their experience. It's usually more either traditional news when they go to the front, or even uh, I don't know something like uh, Wagner themselves putting out videos all the time. I think if if we just talk about the information information battle. Wagner is a kind of a big asset, but also something that the Russians can shoot themselves in the foot with, because to people who are just like seeing what what Wagner does, um, they will think, oh yes, they're very effective, and they try to do a lot of you know things of inspiring people to fight for Russia and think for Russia. Um, but at the same time, I mean, when they post executions, people will be like, yes, <laughs> that's what I thought of them before. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. But that's also one of the reasons why quite often I can actually kind of believe Prigozhin uh, for, for some yeah. of the same success because he is one of the only Russian leaders that can actually get away with it. If he says there's something wrong with the Russian army, then there's a decent chance it's true because there is no reason for him to lie because it's his position. Uh, and anyone else without Wagner behind him, without the information presence uh, online would probably just get removed. So if he says something negative, then that's something that there's at very least a decent chance being true of at least some of it being true. Yeah. Obviously with a heavy, heavy amount of propaganda in between. Obviously. And I think it's not just 
I don't mm. know just influence because he they, we, there's a reason why he's in Bakhmut because there there he have his men protecting him. If he's in <laughs> Moscow, I can tell you, oh my God, he's going to, to be, be invited to have some coffee <laughs> for sure, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, <laughs> that could be a point. Yeah. You mean so Putin? Would... Putin would? Putin is not uh, supporting what he's doing. That's what you're saying. <laughs> No, I, I think uh, okay. My point of view was is that you no, know, there is some, some kind of conflict because, as we all know, Russia is a very corrupt country. So the 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 corruption, you no, know, for people who are very you no know, blunt and straightforward, you no, know, people like me, people like Prigozhin, we we can't stand it. We can't stand the hypocrisy. Then we will just say it out. And for Prigozhin, he's a bit dangerous because he's Russian. But uh, but when he said it out, all this so bluntly, and he's literally pointing out to the Ministry of Defense. It's a problem. He literally said that yeah. he's, he's crap or he's shit. That is going to be a major problem within the Russian bureaucracy because the bureauc- a huge country need bureaucracy. If not, you cannot run the country. And and mm. you try that he's literally attacking the bureaucracy to break the and that will break the system. And he actually encourages the the system to reform. And that makes him very very dangerous. Yeah, they told like yeah. he was probably fall out some window if he would live in Moscow very soon. <laughs> but also, it's a kind of leadership style could be from Putin's uh, uh, point of view. Orbán, for example, the Hungarian prime minister is doing it. Like he's competing his his people. He let them compete. You for for example, Prigozhin competing with Shoigu and Gerasimov. And in this case, they don't really personally attacking Putin. You know, they attacking uh, Shoigu or Prigozhin, or attacking Gerasimov for this style. So these people are competing with each other, and Putin at the end he will benefit from it, and he always a little bit above, you know, from them. It's a higher level, so it could be also the the case. I think I think that is that is very much the case, and that's also the reason why. I mean, it's it's funny to joke about it, but I think um, we're not at the point where Prigozhin will be thrown out the window because he's very beneficial to the Russians, um, in the way For that now. his 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 PMC is uh, the the most effective fighting force, in my opinion, the Russians have. Um, they are extremely decentralized in their command. They complain about the problems they have. They they don't have to have to worry about when they when they complain that they will fear any repercussions. So they can kind of get the most truthful improvements to happen. So when it's clear that there's a huge corruption in the Russian military going on, Wagner can complain about it. They can complain about ammunition that was promised not going through. They can complain about orders being dumb that come from the Russian military because they are just there to achieve their objective and they fight for money. And uh, that's why I think Putin is very much a fan of, of Prigozhin, um, you know, doing this fight underneath him to improve the Russian bureaucracy, to improve the Russian war machine. And try to get as much efficiency out of it as possible. At some point, that may change when Prigozhin starts attacking Putin himself. I don't think he's dumb enough to do it, but we never know. Um, I think at that point, things would change very quickly. But as long as he keeps it on this level, I think Putin is very much supporting what Prigozhin does. Mm. Prigozhin has also the right. main advantage or disadvantage, that depends on how you see it, of Putin can always cut him off and get rid of him without actually having to dirty his hands. He just has to reduce the amount of ammunition or stop him from recruiting because, well, technically PMCs in Russia are illegal. So he can just say, that's illegal, stop recruiting from the Russian population and slowly let him bleed out. If, if he is dumb enough to start a fight with Putin himself, he can just say, okay, then good luck on your own, take back mood if you're lucky enough to do so. Uh, but at the end of it, you're not going to have 10 million uh, between Wagner and your personal bodyguard. Uh, so you're just going to become completely useless and in two months no one's, no one's going to know your name. That's always a possibility for Putin. So Prigozhin had, has kind of the advantage of being safe because he's not safe, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but As long um, as he's useful, he's safe. It's, it's, it's uh, a I, mafia system. Yeah. Yeah. But I think um, Prigozhin's time is, is running out. Remember, he is not allowed to recruit anymore. And soon all the convicts are going home. I guess they're not... <laughs> some, are, some are probably staying, but I doubt many of them are staying. And what's left of Wagner then? 
he's, he's trying to re recruit now in Russia, but I don't know how many he will get. It could be the same situation as the Russian professional army. No, because they also have a six-month contract. And then the war just dragged on for six months and then everybody just left. And then left all the defenses with big holes, which is why we have the Balaglia offensive, we have the Kherson offensive, which all worked because there is not enough soldiers around. I, from, from the time when I was covering, you know, I was wondering how come the, they are sending Donbass militias to Kherson? You no, know, I, I was like, they, they are, I, didn't, I don't really understand. It was only un until you know the, the Ukrainian offensive being so successful that I realized that, oh my freaking God, the entire Russian military have went out of Ukraine. There's literally very, very few of this Russian military left. It's all the Wagner, the volunteers, the church, not even the churches are around, the churches are also left. So it's quite crazy, you know, during those days. So Wagner might, might face the same problem. You no, know, I think they left with like maybe three months if we, from the prison to now. I think it's maybe around three months left. I also don't really know what the plan for integration is. Like, do they plan to, to integrate Wagner as a separate army within the army, like Roskvardia, just that they, Wagner from now on is assault units who have special no. liberties? Or would no. they just disband them altogether? I mean, it's, it's forever going to be like a separate thing. It's like the, yeah. the CIA, CIA army of the, the Russians, <laughs> the kind of thing. You know, like CIA always have this secret stuff that's happening, you know, all around the world. Uh, they are the I mean, CIA. That's what they used them before, right? Yeah, they're still Wagner using was active in all of Africa, kind of parts of Asia, I think. Yeah, always in I exchange think... for gold mines, diamond mines, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's, it's Syria and Central alternative... Africa were the biggest ones. Yeah. Africa for sure. I think they're going to be, go back to that and Maybe Syria more, as well. But yeah, kind of that. Prigoz Prigozhin <clears throat> did say that you know they, they are very happy in Africa, they really enjoy that uh, much more than they are in Ukraine. So yes, yeah, probably. they say that those, those are the happy days, you know. <laughs> so well, I, I, I I to to Africa. Okay. You should so, ask so, the locals about that, <laughs> or they would have different opinion. <laughs> so, it, I, so in the information war between the two countries, it's, it's quite clear that Ukraine is actually much better at the information war. Like, you know, the, the Russians' propaganda is nonsensical. Sometimes it's so so old, so 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 old. Like because they still do the TV way of you no know, kind of thing, then Ukraine is so much more advanced. But you no, know, being uh on the leading pro Ukraine or pro Ukraine, are you worried about misinformation from the Ukrainian side? Uh, because the this is something that you no, know, I even I personally you no know, face with a lot of problems. Like there is a lot of misinformation coming from the Ukrainian side, and sometimes it's very irritating because I'm trying to map the stuff. Uh, but of course, mapping is not that bad. You know, it's, it's more of like the informa other other informations, and and it is it's kind of cloud clouding my mind all the time. Do you all face the same problem? Well, uh, there are two things. I'm sorry, just quickly. There are two things. One is that they they obviously not telling the truth about the number of their losses. I think it has a uh, tactical uh, meaning, but you can calculate that thing. You can, you know figure it out about the numbers. And the other thing is like um, they they leaking information, like for example, what, what we noticed during the autumn yeah, in the time of Liman, Kherson, and uh, when they were leaking, like they were, uh, uh, you know, start their offensive in a certain, certain area, everybody was preparing that and they, they they uh, turn to another point. So uh, if you if you talk about this kind of misinformation, you you have that. I think it's part of the war now because it's you you can't be very transparent about that. You know, like the Russians obviously also hungry for all these informations. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I, it I believe it's I believe it's a little easier on the Ukrainian side to get the right information because there are so many international organizations on the ground. You have the fo or foreign legions, you have foreign fighters, you have foreign fighters giving interview. You can, and nothing on, it's like this on the Ru Russian side. I feel like it's everything I hear, I feel like it's propaganda, but you know, I feel like on the, in the, on the Ukrainian side, you can at least if you really look, you can get quite accurate information. 
that's what I feel. I think it really depends on what like when you talk about accusations of war crimes specifically in very specific cases. Like I'm not talking about something like which I always have accusations of, of people, you know, doing doing horrible shit. And um, then I think if you try to dig deep, you will always find misinformation from, from both sides. But if you base level all you find what's happening broadly on the ground, then it's not too, too hard to fade through misinformation. And I think from both sides as well, um, because you will have pro-Ukrainian pro sources who will you know, try to avoid talking about their losses. You will have pro-Russian sources trying to avoid talking about their losses. Pro-Russian sources will just call all Ukrainian nationalists. Pro-Ukrainian sources will call, I don't know, Russians orcs or whatever. Um, and if, if you simply say, well, I stick to the, to the basic things they try to tell me, it's not too hard to go through um, misinformations if it's about the basic things. But if you try to go deep on, 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 on topics where you have very little ideas about, like the, um, I don't know, the missiles that flew to Poland from Ukraine, where first uh, Zelensky, and I think even, even after everyone said, well, it was a Ukrainian defense missile, um, was claiming it was a Russian one. And then you had people, you know, from all sides trying to distinguish, well, what was the rocket? Well, it was a Ukrainian made one. And then people saying, oh, it was intentionally shot. Others saying, well, it was about malfunction. I think stuff like that, where, where it's up to a lot of speculation, you will find tons of, tons of misinformation that you pretty much just have to ignore. You can't use it. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of things, I think, also what we act actually cannot know and probably it will take years from now to realize the real numbers for example what's happening now in Bakhmut if what is the real kill ratio if the Ukrainians are keeping Bakhmut because they can produce a very good kill ratio versus against the Russian like seven to one are they really can do that or all the time still at the moment as well when they already almost encircled not for sure it could be another reason to stay there as well but the real numbers like how much losses they have now at the moment and the rush on the russian side as well we will probably will take years to know that i mean you just have to look at the difference in numbers going around i mean if you believe the ukrainians it's like eight to one if you believe nato it's six to one i think if you believe the Austrians, it's, I think, four and a half to one. And if you believe the, I think it was the Sing, no, no, not the Singapore's, the, the Thai, it's two to one. And if you believe the Russians, it's actually three to one in their favor. <laughs> so you can pick and choose whatever you want to believe because nobody has any clue. You Which is why you know, I have a rule. It's always one to one, like because you know, if it's proven this, different. Uh, but you, it's, you cannot prove it because let's say this artillery shell hit you, you just dis disintegrate. Yeah, you don't even have a corpse to count. So, so which is why you know I always put it as one to one. The only thing that the the Ministry of Defenses will know is their losses, because the you, the units you start to lose contact with, you know how much units you lost. So both sides definitely hundred percent know who how much they have lost. But of course, these are operational secrets. They will not say. Uh, but no, for me, as a as a rule of thumb, it's always one-to-one. -one. Whichever the propaganda like to say, you know, oh, they lost they lost how many soldiers? I'm going to assume that the other side is going to lose exactly the same number of soldiers. I think that's how I operate because that's the only way you can keep sane. If not, you'll go insane with all, you know, all these different ratios going all over the place. Like, like, no, how big is the Wagner private military contractors? How can you kill seven-to-one? But then they wouldn't have a Wagner military contractor you know, by now. The Wagner group would be entirely entirely wiped out by now. So, so but the thing is, we also do not know because who knows, they really have 100,000 troops. <laughs> that I, I really have no idea. Yeah, and also, the uh, to be honest... Get yeah. to uh, guessing the casualties is something that I think uh, BBC Russia is doing. They are statistically picking random towns in Russia and counting the obituaries of military-aged men. And statistically guessing whether or not how many in all of Russia could be killed. That's the closest we're going to get because Russian losses, I think, even from World War II are still state secret. So the best guesses we have are from historians from outside Russia. So I think we're never going to know the actual casualties. I think even if you look at World War II numbers, right, until today, we still don't, do not know. Yeah, the yeah numbers. Exactly, it's always a range. 
He's always That's also link. also it, it, it becoming a part of the game, you know, like uh, when you when the loss loss uh, losses part to be a pay compensation or something. The a higher casualties you can produce, then you can claim more compensation. So probably never will know. But there is a reason why the Ukrainians are there in Bakhmut, and I think uh, it's probably one of the reasons. Hmm. I think also Ukraine has to kill more. Ukraine have, have to kill more Russians. Ukraine, Ukraine have to kill more Russians. So if you look at Vukovar and also in Avdiivka now, there are so the losses are just enormous. And you, I've been watching uh, um, the Ukrainian stats the last couple of months, and also looked at what evidence I can visually find on Twitter or other channels, and it's not so far when it comes to tanks and uh, planes and all. I don't know how it was in the summer, probably a lot wrong, but I feel now they are quite accurate in when they claim this and this many tanks and this this many APCs. I think the issue is that we, the thing is we, we can never really know, and the more accurately yeah. seen, the, the, more, the more I think we will start to over rely on that, because in the end, I mean, Especially when we talk about 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 ratios going away from one to one, but saying one side definitely killed more and has lost less, I think we we, we kind of start to to lose the overall picture. Because I mean, yeah. the, the offensives in Kherson at the start, and I don't know, I mean, they, they pretty much started as soon as Kherson was taken, and the assault on Mikolai failed. At the start, they just butted their heads into walls, and a lot of Ukrainians died there, and we do not know how that was picked up. I mean. The Russian MOD, at the, and, and I mean, that's really their problem. They're just out of touch with reality. They think that people really believe them. I think it was in May or, or June when they once put out a list of Ukrainian losses, and they claimed to have shot down more Bayraktar drones than Ukraine ever had. And they claimed that, I don't know, 65% of Ukrainian tanks were destroyed or something. I, I saved it up somewhere to just check back from time to time and see how things have turned out. But at some point, I, I don't know, I think they stopped doing it. I haven't seen any, any new information coming from them. Um, but the Ukrainian MOD instead has numbers which seem like they could be somewhat realistic. But I mean, what they're, are they currently claiming? 160,000 dead or something? 180,000? I'm not entirely sure. But if we if we scale it up and say, well, for each dead, you have four which are injured or three who are injured, you still end up with a number that is massive. And I don't think is is true. I think that is definitely overstated. And it would be also be overstated if the Russians claimed that. So... I think going away from one to one is really where you where you go into speculation that also doesn't really help help the point to, to get an accurate picture. Yeah, I, I agree. Did, did did I say the Russian MOD? I meant the Ukrainian. If I said no, wrong. you meant Ukrainian. I just used the the Russian as a counter example. Yeah. Okay. But if you look at Oryx, uh, that channel has been going on for a long time before the war, and he is really he don't put in any losses. And I have a look at the, these losses, and also the Russians are sending in a lot of these uh, um, Landsat drone attacks. I think there are hundreds of them now. So I've, because this ratio, finally, it will have, have something to say about the outcome of the war, about how many, how much equipment is lost. So it's, but I, I watch, I follow Oryx, and I feel that's a reliable source. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Orange is, is, is definitely one of one of the the, I mean, it's the best thing we have, really. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, regarding the geolocation and finding out which specific model they always choose is hard. But again, they have never been uh, like exposed to to take anything double. Nothing of that no. ever happened. So until now, they seem like they only counted every vehicle once. And even if they then mismatch the category, um, I think it's 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 something that really tells you that they are one of the most reliable things until now. And at least regarding equipment losses, I would also think that I would look at Oryx and say, well, this is as accurate as we can get. Yeah. It's just an interesting thing. I heard it from there is this professor, Michael Clark. He used to go to the Sky Channel for to like consult or analyze the, the, the state of the war. And he said, like, the, um, considering the number of the troops Russia and Ukraine can uh bring up or or put on the front ukraine has to maintain a one to three kill ratio all the time at least 
Else if it's lower, they losing the war. So they have to take all the opportunities like in Bakhmut, if they can uh, go to a higher, a significantly higher number like that, they have to use that opportunity uh, to actually, you know, just to fight the numbers. So to disable as many Russian soldiers as they can to be that ratio, because sometimes they have to make sacrifices and what they are facing now if they will prepare or as they preparing to the offensive of the spring, they probably will not able to do this as they will be on the offensive side. Russians are digging in. Obviously, they can't do this uh, very good ratio. So I think they were and also like they wanted to disable Wagner over there, I think. <clears throat> so it's a good segue to this point because the next uh so-called agenda, you know, the question I want to really ask is, what do you all think of the war situation now? Uh, especially from the viewpoint of the Ukrainians, because uh, Russian opini opinions, I have a lot, like, you know, I always, all my all my supporters, you know, most of them are pro-Russian, although they are, some of them are just crazy also. <laughs> but, you know, the what do you all actually think of the situation? Because my, po my point of view might actually also be clouded, you no, know, because, um, because I have my own uh, sources and that might also fits into you no know, certain narrative that might be wrong, you no, know, or like my beliefs of what the Russian military is might be wrong. So you know, what do you guys think? You know, the war situation now. I have a question that might actually uh, fit quite nicely in here. Do you think casualties are actually going to be important in this war? Are going to be a factor that ends this war? Because whenever I look at history, especially for example, World War One, uh, the French had a similar population. I'm looking at casualty figures that are so absolutely horrendous that I think I, I think it was seven million casualties in World War One for the French. Same population, same population, and I mean that would be five times seven years. Yeah, yeah I would say that uh, you actually the... have problems with manpower. Yeah. In, in World War One, every offensive is in the millions. Uh, I don't think um, uh, the population. I don't think it, it will have some anything to do with the end of this war. But I think if Russia mobilizes, they're talking about new mobilization in the Reibach report today. But if you look at all the equipment they're losing, what are they going to? There are no more tanks. They're bringing up the BMPs 50s. So I think the equipment has something to say. Not, not. It, also, also not the number of the of the people also because they already had like a demographic problems in Russia, uh, like China has now, and they will lose like a work uh, work uh, work able generation now. Like if they will st uh, stuck in this war for a couple of more years. They will have like a significant loss just because what they lose on the front line and on the other side, the people are emigrating. So ac actually on the longer term, uh, economically, they will suffer on, uh, because of this also, not just because of the the damage what they suffer like in, in like materials, but they, they will not have like a working population. So in from this perspective, it really matters like how much people they lose. But it was always, it was never a problem for Russia, you know, the Second World War, like a very typical example for that, like they didn't care like how much the casualties, they just have to push for Berlin, right? Yeah, 